Hello, everyone. Russ of Aquarimax here with Kyle from Roach Crossing. Welcome, Kyle. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Kyle has done all sorts of interesting things with invertebrates for a long time now. You've, your website's been up since 2011. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> but you've been you've been working with invertebrates and things like that for years mm -hmm. beyond that as well. So. Very awesome. Of course, even though his website says Roach Crossing, that's not all he's into. He's very into roaches, of course, but he has all kinds of isopods of various types. He's got invertebrates of many sizes, shapes, and descriptions. So we're going to get into that uh, tonight. So welcome, everyone. I see that Frank to Tank, Neon X, some eggs, the science <laughs> layer, and invertebrate dude are all here already. So that is great to see you here. Um, Anything else you want to say uh, just to start out, Kyle, before I dive into some questions? Uh, not in particular. I'm, I think I'm good to go on whatever. Okay, great. Well, the, the first thing I'd like to do besides uh, just welcome you is uh, talk about some of the comments we're getting from Patreon. Um, the first one we've got here from TrufflePig42. I'll read that out, and then you can uh, answer at your leisure. It says... Hi, Kyle. I really enjoyed your bio. I, too, am working to eradicate lawns. <laughs> I planted Dutch white clover everywhere in order to improve soil quality and provide opportunities for pollinators. I prefer native planting, but I live in suburbia, so it's all I could do to destroy it and also avoid exile. My question <laughs> is, what does your typical breeding system look like for your roaches? How do you prefer to maintain heat and humidity? Thanks. Looking forward to hearing your live stream. So, um, so in years past, I used a lot of Sterilite totes, a lot of plastic containers, and they work very well, especially if you have uh, dry air and a lot of airflow. Um, so that's what I used for, for many years. And within the last two years, because I have more space and I want to, you know, get a little bit more interaction in with my, my collection, of I started switching to uh, glass enclosures for a lot of the roach species, at least, because then I can, it's easier to do checks on them, you know, just casually, like looking in it at night. Um, and the screen tops means I can just spray into water with, I have like a big herbicide sprayer that I have, you know, not herbicide, but water in uh, that I use to do top watering. Um, and so I've, I've really liked using the glass, uh, the glass aquariums uh, recently for roaches. And for isopods, I still use the, the totes because. I just have so many projects, and if I had all glass tanks, I would go a little bit crazier than I already am. So, um, for heat, uh, I use a, a mix of everything. I've used room heaters in the past. I've used uh, like brooder bulbs for for chickens, um, like the big 250 watt ones. Uh, so now, since I have a larger space to heat, I use uh, a quartz room heater, which I'm going to be switching off of those just because they don't seem to like being on 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I have a smaller forced, ha forced air uh, heater unit that I've started using. I'm probably going to start switching them, um, switching the other ones to that. Um, and I also use heat lamps for some species that really like a lot of extra heat, like a Lipterina david eye and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes no. sense. And uh, what about, uh, let's see, you, you mentioned humidity, you mentioned heat. So yeah, I guess you covered the, the questions pretty well there. What, what do you do in terms of uh, substrate and hides and things like that, depending on species or? So yeah, I, I have a general mix uh, that I use just it's just sort of my go-to if I don't, you know, if I don't want to put too much thought power into to something or if I uh, have a lot of enclosures to make, I'll just use my typical roach and isopod mix, which is basically just coconut fiber, coconut croutons, hardwood chips, sphagnum moss, and well-rotted leaf litter. But sometimes, you know, if something needs rotted wood like millipedes, um, I'll mix I'll mix a little bit of that in as well. So, but, you know, a little bit more of some things for some species and others, like mm -hmm. if I was setting up something like a like a blabberus boliviensis or discoidalis something that's not too picky i'll just go with the standard mix but if i want you know if i'm going to be saying of a hisser enclosure i'll go with something that has a bit more of those chunky pieces in it so it gives the the nymphs a little extra hiding space so okay that makes sense so i've got a couple of questions related to this question some eggs is asking if you use petroleum jelly as a barrier 
So I used to use petroleum. I used to be all about the Vaseline lifestyle. In fact, when I was uh, in high school, that was what my science fair project was on, was which uh, barrier worked most effectively at stopping uh, hissing cockroaches from climbing up smooth surfaces. And from those trials, and that was using stuff like olive oil, and uh, at the time there was a product called Insecta Slip. Um, and so that was using all those different materials. And I found out of that assemblage that petroleum jelly Vaseline worked the best. So that's what I used for a very long time um, until uh, Adam um, Sias introduced me to this new, what he was calling the roach no crossing barrier, which is some sort of non-organic heat resistant, cold resistant, smear resistant, everything resistant uh, grease that is used for lubricating certain types of uh, machinery in like candy factories. So it's also food safe. It's a nerd. Sure. Um, and so I've been using that and I, I don't think I can ever go back to using Vaseline. And I, the results <laughs> from using this, this new material are just, are just too good for keeping a, just everything contained. So I've been mm -hmm. using it for all the, especially the tiny uh, ectobiids that are very prone to escaping. I've been using it for those. So is it, I know that Vaseline can present problems when it gets dust or other debris on it. Is mm -hmm. uh, this roach no crossing barrier different in that regard? Uh, well, it's just seemed to be more effective all around. And even though you'll still get dust and you'll still get like uh, fungus gnats in there and, and things like that, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to hinder the effectiveness as drastically as those materials getting into Vaseline would. Okay. Um, and it also, I don't think it's soluble in water, but it is easier to clean off than Vaseline as well. So it's a little bit easier to do like touch-ups to, to sort of clean it off. You know, if you've got a lot of particulate matter in it over time, uh, it's a lot easier to, to sort of refresh as well. Okay, nice. So uh, let's see. Insane Isopods is asking how you deal with roach species that can fly to keep them contained. So um, that it's it's skill in in some regard. Um, so it's you know trying to open the container and not allowing them to fly out or um, with or with like gyna they tend to stay buried in the substrate until you put the food in or there's some sort of or you water. So I'll usually do those things first. Um, but a lot of roaches don't seem insanely inclined to fly at like average room temperature um, mm -hmm. might ha have something to do with like their wing muscles being warmed up or just it, it's not a normal behavior for them when they're cold. Um, so most of the time I don't really have too many problems when I open bins with things flying out, even though the, the bug room is a consistent like 75 to 78 degrees. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's basically how I deal with those um, in terms of like opening the enclosure and then flying out in terms of just um, keeping them in, uh, I'll have a solid lid if, for the species that I still have in like uh, hexagonal containers, or I will, I have like a, a screen mesh that I underlay on all of my enclosures just because I'm extremely paranoid about like anything getting out or, or getting into a bin it shouldn't be in. So I'll have an underlay as well as the lid and then a gasket on that lid so that will all set in together. And then the barrier too. So most of the time, you know, if I open the bin, I don't have any problems with anything being up near the top. Even the flying species will get up there. It'll be too dry up in the air column or they'll feel uncomfortable because they're exposed and they'll go back down into the substrate. Sweet. Okay. Well, uh, Sandy is asking, Sandy Sizemore asks, Wonder if certain roaches are more nutritious than others when feeding mm -hmm. our reptile friends. So I think in general, a lot of roaches probably have very similar nutrients in them, at least by family. So I would think that a lot of the, the, the blabberid roaches have very similar nutrient content and that uh, bladids and, and so on all do. In general, because roaches have their bladibacterium endosymbionts and they're able to recycle nitrogen very effectively due to that relationship, a lot of them tend to have a higher protein than other insects. Um, and they're probably also, I, I would also say, probably higher in, in fat and in, in not bad fat, but like, you know, good um, longer, is it longer, shorter chain? I think it's longer chain uh, fats. So... Mm -hmm. 
And I think it, the nutrient content definitely varies with the age of the roach. So I would think that a sub-adult that is just getting kind of close to molting but isn't quite there will probably have the most fat in it because um, all the fat bodies are swollen up and it's, you know, it's it's probably the, 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 the girthiest, girthiest that it's ever going to be at that point before it molts into an adult. And then after that, a lot of the energy is put into reproduction instead of into, you know, getting to the point where they can reproduce. Um, and also adult females that have, have an, an uthika in them will probably be very high in fat just because uh, an uthika is high in fat in general. Um, yes. If you don't mind me going off on just a quick weird aside here, no, I, have, this is good. I have eaten um, some cockroach uthika in the past, um, mostly from blabberus. You know, if there's one that if I go to do work in an enclosure and one of them is forming an ooth and then drops it, I'll be like, you know, this is a bit weird, but, you know, this could be the future of like of like the human mankind civilization diet. So I, I've tried it a couple times and it tastes like it's like a like a like a buttery very buttery flavor and taste hmm. um in fact i it has a very gourmet flavor i would say and i think that's probably because of the high amount of fat that's in uh, a cockroach egg case at least in like a blabberid that you know that accidentally extruded it instead of taking it back into the body to incubate so mm -hmm. so yeah basically if you feed an adult female with a, an egg case inside of her that's probably the, the most nutritious kind of roach that you can feed to something, but you probably don't want to decimate your colony by only feeding female, adult female cockroaches. So uh. <laughs> I like that. that's, that's a pretty awesome answer to that. Yeah, trade offs, that. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, invertebrate dude saying that he's thinking the roach, uh, no crossing barrier is possibly silicone, silicone oil. Could be. Um, I've, I've, I had asked Adam about his contents, but he, he wished to, to keep it an industry secret for the time being, but I'm sure, sure if somebody were to, were to pester him, maybe he would tell them, <laughs> you know, so. Okay. We've got a question from Neon X saying, what is your favorite small roach species? Oh, small. So like, if we're going with like under like two centimeters, you know, I really, I really like Parker Blatta. I really like the the Twain Heart locality that I have of Parker Blatta Ameri CF Americana. Um, and you know, I really like the uh, Globtrix Gemma, or uh, Gemma that uh, Alan John sent me. I'm really, really liking the little gem roaches. Like, even though they're lightning fast and they seem to like a lot of heat and whatnot, and they seem, you know, just a little bit trickier than a lot of other small roaches. I'm really liking them because there's just something about their color that's just very eye-catching, you know, and, and just seeing them dart around the enclosure is, is just when you, like, lift a piece of bark or something. is just something something to that, even though I can, can't put my finger on it exactly. Mm -hmm. So so there's a there's a locality of this Parco Blata genus that is from Twain Heart, California. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to tell my wife about that. She'll be excited. <laughs> she, she's not a big roach fan, but she actually grew up in Twain Heart. So I'm going to have really? to tell her. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's just a small world. And so, was, I have I have it on my site who collected them originally. Um, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I can't remember his name. I think it was Kevin um, mm -hmm. who went up there and collected them at some, some certain ele elevation because he had come across them before. Um, and it was just they were – a little different than the Americana that were on, you know, all the pictures I'm, of Bug Guide were of, of the smaller, like more of a rufousy brown roach. These ones are definitely more of like a definitive black slash chocolate brown. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very pretty roach. And I don't know if he'll ever be able to go back there. Apparently, there's more than a few people who know of that place's existence. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, she can be proud that. Um, she at least said there's a there's a cockroach locality from her hometown. <laughs> yeah, that's so. pretty cool. I uh, I've been there a million times and I've actually flipped some roaches and I'm, I'm wondering now <laughs> what mm -hmm. species they were. So uh, I haven't been back for a while, but mm -hmm. maybe when I go back, I'll take a look and see. What <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, and I think it's Ka Spa says, "What's the best medium to large roach to keep?" <sighs> That's a complicated question. Um, once you get past a certain 
size is just like they're all just really cool. I mean, it's just a, it's a huge insect, and there's something very like primordial and something just very awesome about having a gigantic bug and having a colony of them too. So you know, I really like Eublabarus. I really like that genus a lot. Um, and Eurycotus is re- is really great too. Just because they're, I I just have sort of a little fascination with Eurycotus because they're in the they're a polyzosterine roach, which is the group that contains a lot of those really pretty roaches that live in Australia, and so you know there's this ancient link between like Australia's fauna and like you know North and South America's, and right. it's just very fascinating to think about you know having this sort of like almost little piece of an entirely different continent that is, you know, especially like Eurycotus floridana endemic to North America. And so I really like Eurycotus too. So I'd say Eublabrus and Eurycotus is two really good uh, genera. Cool. So I know you have some roaches there with you that you can Mm -hmm. share with us, um, some fairly large ones. So do you want to break those out now? I would love to, um, and I will have a, a shout out to Invertebrate Dude because um, I have some pure hissers here, and I know that that's one of his his uh, passions at the moment. Talking to Dr. Beccaloni and trying to figure out, you know, hisser taxonomy and what's what and who has what. So, I'm just gonna grab these fellas here. I was actually a little surprised going into these uh, enclosures, and uh, you can hear the quote-unquote Princessia here. Whoops, he's the loudest of the four. Oh yeah. So, just keep up the suspense. <laughs> oh, you are very upset, aren't you? You can see so, as it help. Oh, here we yeah. have, um, here we have a bunch of hissers. So I'll try and go in one by one. And it was a little stressful for me having them all in the same place at the same time. I am such a purist when it comes to tracking lines and cultures of stuff. So it's it's difficult for me to like put two things like this, you know, close to each other because like, oh, what if you know, I accidentally had a nymph stuck on its leg or something when I pull it out, and then I'm gonna put them back and I'm gonna cross contaminate or something. But um, it was worth it to to spread the cause. So this is a um, Gromphodorina. Grandadieri, as we we have been calling them in the U.S. culture, in the European culture, it's a princessia, um, and a lot of the taxonomy on this hopefully will be examined within the next ten years, as we said ten years ago. Um, <laughs> so this is this is um, what is traded as you know pure Gromphodorina grandadieri. It's it's an ent- it's, it's it is a hissing cockroach entity which has this little notch in the top of the pronotum there where you can kind of see the head through it. Um, you know, it's the, the, the striped coloration with, you know, no, no blobs of orange or missing stripes or anything like that. Um, so this is the, the tiger hisser as we've called, called them. Mm-hmm. And in captivity, even though, especially in the last couple of years, uh, myself and Dan Greiner have been working on creating some, some hisser morphs. Um, and there was some talk that like, Hey, maybe these, you know, really pretty colorful hissers are not the wild type, basically, you know, people got them to captivity and then selectively bred them very quickly, uh, you know, for these, these traits. And then we lost basically the wild phenotype. Um, but I have some pictures, my, my undergrad advisor sent me of an Elliptorina javanica, the, the Halloween hisser in the wild, you know, he, he found one under a piece of bark in Madagascar and lo and behold, it looked exactly like our captive stock. So it's likely that there's some sort of ad- adaptational purpose to this sort of coloration hmm. um, on these guys and that it's, it is a natural thing that occurs in their wild populations. So moving on, we have this big guy, which people probably saw in the, the oh, thumbnail really? for the event. This right. is a by the book Princessia Van Weere uh, and I, I some of these Latins, the pronunciation. I took a Latin, Latin co- two Latin courses in high school, and you know nobody really knows how to pronounce Latin. There's some <laughs> general guidelines um, for things like 
for example, Lampyridae, fire, the family that fireflies belong to, the, the A-E at the end is pronounced E. And then you go into to something, um, another taxon, and they'll pronounce the A-E as I or A, you know. So there's there's a lot of, you know, within certain studies, there's a lot of differences in pronunciation. So Princisia van Wierebeckei. Um, but this is um, my one of my last two adult males. This is a, this is a huge male. It's probably one of the biggest ones I've ever produced. Um, and hopefully the colony will start producing more of these because they, they need more people culturing them in the U.S. because their, their, their numbers have really declined uh, in culture of the pure stock. So this is a, this is a, a pure Princessia van Wierbeckei male. Uh, and moving on, big boys, we have Gromphodorina oblongonota. And you know, I'm just now noticing the lighting doesn't exactly get um, a lot of the colors. So what I'll probably do is I'll go out and grab my headlamp um, okay. and go back in when I'm done going through them and to, to really show off the coloration. So this is oblongonota, um, big horns on the front there, really big horns. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, this is another pure individual. And this is another. This is a pretty big male as well. Um, so, and this is usually uh, confused with hybrids, or people's colonies are hybrids with the quote-unquote common hissing cockroach, Gromphodorina portentosa, over here. So, this is pure stock from uh, the Cleveland Aquarium. This is from Orrin's really, really old line uh, that goes back at the uh, Cleveland Aquarium. So, you'll notice there's. There's no tiger stripes on the abdomen. It's a very consistent body coloration with uh, the black towards the front and then more orange towards the, the abdomen. So yeah. yeah, these are my my big my big boy hissers here showing off being representatives for their kind. Cool. So. <laughs> yeah, it's cool seeing all the different types and knowing that there's still pure lines out there because so many in the hobby are not. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's cool. Good all right. Boys. <laughs> yeah, and there's some seriously impressive size on those things too. Like you're saying, there's some huge males there. Yeah, I think people would be surprised at how um, well a lot of how big a lot of things will get on a quote unquote you know low protein diet because there seems to be this obsession with invertebrates that you gotta give them tons and tons of protein for some reason if you want them to to thrive and to do well, and that's just simply not the case. So. Mm -hmm. These guys were all raised on crappy dog fruit, food from nards and apples and zucchinis and eggplants and all that stuff. They they've never received any sort of pampering in the, in their lives, at least in that sense. You know, no fifty dollar two pound bag of cat food. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's like you're saying the uh, they have the the symbiotic gut bacteria that help them utilize what protein they get mm -hmm. very well. That makes sense. So um, Gadsden is asking if dermestid beetles in a dubia culture is a good idea. What do you think? It depends on how well the colony is doing. It seems like, you know, I've always suspected that dermestids will eat roaches situationally if they're, you know, starved for other things. Um, but then there were some times where I was keeping uh, Dermestes maculatus with dubias and the colony was just thriving. So it seems to be dependent on what's going into the colony and what sort of state they're in. Because, mm -hmm. excuse me, presently, it seems a lot of feeder colonies um, are compromised with Dermestes aider, which is the, the black larder beetle, the one that flies and is kind of annoying. Um, and I think those have been, there's been some information on those going after sort of live organisms. So I think it depends on your culture. And at some point, if something works, it just sort of works, you know. So um, the, the buffalo beetles, the alpha tobia seem to be the safer bet all around. Uh, but if you, if you have a lot of dead roaches in your colony and you think it's necessary that you have to use Dermestes maculatus and that's your only option, then I think you probably should re-examine your husbandry and find out why you have so many roaches dying so consistently. So, right. yeah, that makes sense. I like that. Let's see. Uh, Invertebrate dude asks what your most exciting roach project currently going on is. Ooh, exciting roach projects. Well, getting the Princessia back on track has been, you know, 
it's ups and downs waiting for the female to, to have a litter and whatnot. So I think that's been pretty exciting for me. Um, doing the selective breeding with the, the common, the pure common hissers has been a lot of fun too. Like um, the, the line I'm working on, I'd like to call Lilliputian, which is where they are the size if not smaller than the, the dwarf hisser species. So I'm having a lot of fun with the selective breeding there and also wondering like, you know, is this going to mess some things up down the line? Um, which is why I feel it's important to give things very distinct original names when you're naming lines so that we don't end up with a situation like isopods where there's like 50 lines called ghost and they're all completely different things. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I would think that that um, going to Florida primarily to collect uh, Aaron Vega, Floridensis, different localities. I'm really excited because over the last couple of years, I've really fallen in love with Aaron Vega. Just the fact that there's so many species in the U S and you know, the majority of them, we have no idea what the adult females look like because the taxonomy is done with the males. Mm -hmm. So um, looking forward to getting some localities of Aaron Vega, Floridensis uh, when we head down there um, yeah, so I'd, I'd say that those are some of the most exciting projects at the moment. Nice. So Arthropod Ambassadors uh, asks if, uh, well, she's glad to see roaches getting this kind of attention mm -hmm. and said that hissers are one of the critters that got her into the hobby and wants to know oh, what, oh, are good, what are uh, good pure stock sources for hissers. Um, so I won't necessarily pat myself on the back, but you've got, uh, myself, um, I believe Ty Randall, if he's working with them, but Ty is having a rough time with the, the weather situation since he's in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if, if, uh, invertebrate dude, if you have, he might have, uh, pure hissers and of course, Oren, uh, from bugs, if Oren is still vending through bugs in cyberspace, um, that's a good place to go to as well. Um, but other than that, I, I, uh, I, I'm very paranoid about keeping my lines of stuff pure, especially things that I've known historically have had problems with people creating hybrids. So uh, it's it's for me, I always want to just say myself and then whoever has gotten track lines from me or other people that can trace their lines pretty far back, basically. Uh, Dan Greiner at Limberlost Exotics, uh, he's sort of rebuilding his sister collection at the moment. And we'll probably have some available eventually as well. Cool. So Awesome Animals with Alicia V is asking if chicken crumble is appropriate for feeding roaches. If it works, it works. Um, my first hisser colony, even though they were hybrids, I, I don't think this necessarily has an effect on on this discussion per se. But my, my first hisser colony, I fed all kinds of things because I was young and impatient and wanted babies and wanted results and stuff. And so I would just throw all kinds of weird things in there and they would eat through pretty much everything with, you know, good vigor and whatnot. So if your chicken, chicken crumbles work, then they work, you know, um, it's, if you start having problems, you start seeing a die off or you start getting grain mites or something like that, then it's time to re-examine you know, either what you're feeding or how you're feeding. But I think it's, at some point somebody had asked me about one of their roach colonies and they were like, you know, they're doing great. I have like hundreds, they're breeding like crazy. I'm feeding them this and this, and I'm taking care of them this way. Am I doing things right? And it's like, I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you're doing it wrong if it's working, you know, yeah. so at some point, if it works, it works. Um, and it's helpful for me to have really cheap dog kibble on hand because a lot of the stuff that I, I have, except for a dog, will eat it. <laughs> I would never feed that dog food to an actual dog, but everything else, you know, um, is, is fair game. So, um, yeah, if it, if it works, it works. Um, cool. So Neon X is asking, why does purity in the captive culture with regard to the hissers, why, why does it matter? Well, um, there's a couple different angles here, and I will bring up that invertebrate dude had talked to George Beccoloni about the possibility of wild populations of hissing cockroach crossing um, with the, the creation of new roads and, you know, various changes to uh, the environment in Madagascar. And having talked to somebody, um, one of my coworkers from U of M when I worked at the Interpretive Center who went to Madagascar for a couple of weeks telling me about 
basically the the doom and the gloom and the destruction that she had seen to the habitats because she was there for studying lemurs um it just sort of painted a very gloomy picture so it, it's entirely possible that in the wild different populations of hissers are now interbreeding it's entirely possible um on paper you know i they, they probably have very low dispersal because they're wingless and they're they're long lived and they're slow moving, which means they probably don't get around much. But you know, you open up one road and logging materials are moved and you have a female on there, you can very easily transport them uh, between different locations. But basically, the reason why it's important to keep them pure in captivity is because it's entirely possible that one day they may need to be re-added back to the wild. And even though we don't have locality information for a lot of these hissers, um, we still have specimens and, and can use, you know, the very vague morphological cues and, and um, patterns and whatnot to try and piece together where they may belong. And then the question is, well, why does it matter that you use, you know, the right species or the right morph or something like that? And then it's just kind of a semantics thing, you know? whether or not we want to preserve the world the way that it was and do our part to steward it and, you know, make sure that it's maintained in a functional state or, you know, do we just want to throw things at the wall and say, Hey, it, it, if we introduce them, you know, we can use any species and it'll fill the same niche. And who cares if we lost one that had black stripes instead of orange stripes or something like that. So, you know, in some ways it does and it doesn't matter, but I think it's also important that if people are going to be from a, from a, um, from a buyer perspective, if you're going to be buying a species of cockroach that you're going to get the species of cockroach that you are purchasing basically. So if you want a large red and black striped cockroach and you get something that somebody says is Gromphodorino blongonota, and all of a sudden you have a small uh, orange and black cockroach you're going to be like, well, what is this? You know, this isn't what I saw online. This isn't what people have been keeping for years, you know? So there's a lot of different angles and why I would say it's important to keep them isolated and to, to work with pure stock when you can. Um, I mean, human history is also based on crossing things. So many of our crops and our domestic animals are the product of crossing different subspecies and varieties and whatnot. So if you want to have a, his, a, a, a hybrid hisser line to use as feeders or something like that, that's totally fine. That's, you know, I guess as long as you don't go around selling them as pure stock of something because they look a little bit like something you saw online, you know. So, you know, there's a lot of different angles you can look at it from. But, I mean, personally, it's like... Gromphodorina blongonota. Who knows when, you know, if my colony went extinct, who knows when I would be able to get more peers or something like that. So I'm going to try and preserve it in its state as I, as I can, basically. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And Invertebrate Duke just chimed in saying, it also allows for more diversity in the hobby since hybrids often lose the unique mm. features. I mean, yes, I think I would like to thank, thank him for pointing that out. Yeah, the, the unique features like uh, different species of hisser have different hisses that they make for courtship and other reasons so you know if we're just crossing everything all willy-nilly and another 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 point is that uh there's some things that happen in captivity that don't necessarily or wouldn't necessarily happen in the wild like i accidentally created aileropoda and cygnus and gromphodorina grandidiri hybrids so cross genre um <laughs> hybrids in captivity and you know they if i hadn't you know, looked at them very closely and said, this does not look like a pure Gromphodorina grandidiri. If I didn't like take a second and realize that something was off, I could have just distributed those as pure grandidiri. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then eventually, you know, somebody else would mix them in their colony. They have a pure colony. They want to add more for genetic diversity. Then they add those in. Then you've got a compromised colony and, you know, it just sort of snowballs from there. And then you end up with the blabberous discoidalis situation where, probably 90% plus of the stock in the United States is compromised with boliviensis and you get reduced vigor. So it's a worse feeder too. So mm -hmm. it's a complicated, you know, situation. Yeah. But those are also some valid points. What is it that causes the reduced vigor? That's interesting. So mm -hmm. this is a, this is a thing. It just it has to do with their genetic compatibility. And I am no geneticist, although I will say my girlfriend is one and I know she's watching. So hi, Jen. Um, but 
sometimes you get you get uh, inbreeding vigor or inbreeding depression when you cross things that are closely related to each other. So you know the idea of like having an inbred strain of something producing you know less young or not growing as fast or something like that. And then you can also have outbreeding vigor where you know crossing two distantly related lines of something will produce a a more vigorous or fit. Um, line from those, but then sometimes you can get outbreeding depression too, and that's because you know the, there's an inherent incompatibility there, which is why you know things like to take a, an age-old example, why crossing horses and donkeys, you get a mule and it's reproductively sterile. You know, it has physical vigor and and whatnot, but there's from a population genetic standpoint, it is incapable of reproducing. Therefore, it has no reproductive potential there. Right. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the thing is sometimes when you cross these things and they're just, you know, they're evolutionarily separated just enough that there are some, some boundaries or some pieces genetically that don't fit there. And then you get an individual produced from that, that is just sort of, you know, not as vigorous, not as, as reproductively, uh, effective as either the pure species. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. All right. Well, Casey, Alyssa is asking about one of her roaches. She says one of her smaller, I don't know if it's he or she, but the, mm -hmm. the, the roach is a female that I don't know about the, the person, but it says one mm -hmm. of the smaller females looks like it was attacked. Part of its exoskeleton around the head is gone. She's mm -hmm. been dying for weeks now. Mm -hmm. uh, can't walk or move around anymore. Can only mm -hmm. wiggle legs. Any idea on that one? Um, I mean, roaches are pretty, pretty pretty sturdy and they can take some surprising damage and be okay um but really if it, it sounds like maybe it was damaged during a molt in which case sometimes they will take damage and their body will just persist long after you know it, it, it they're doomed ultimately but sometimes they'll just persist after that just because that's just how they are they're very sturdy animals and they don't necessarily need every single part operating at maximum capacity just to continue existing so right. So it's unfortunate and it, it happens, you know, sometimes in captivity and probably even more so in the wild. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just another part of, of dealing with living organisms and all the quirks that that entails. Yep. Yep. I guess mismolts happen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, one thing I wanted to make sure that we do, uh, a couple of people have asked about this and mm -hmm. I, I, about you, your, presence on youtube they want to know mm -hmm. if you're going to be uploading soon that kind of stuff so it's in the cards um and i've blogged a little bit about it um i would like to be in a little better place in terms of my schedule and whatnot to be able to consistently upload and it's always been something i've wanted to do but i like having i'd like to have a nice controlled space and that's actually why i've started renovating this room is to use as sort of a, an office space and, and for videos and whatnot so it's in the cards. I would say don't necessarily expect it within the next six months, but it may happen. Um, so I, I would really like to start doing uh, some some little biological videos showing people how to set up stuff and some comparisons of things side by side with good lighting and whatnot. Um, but there, there's also other parts of that is video editing and, and having proper lighting and all that other stuff basically a lot of it is I, I have a certain expectation for what I'd like to provide with provide people with and I would like to be at that before I start regularly producing content. So right. that is smart because you it's really easy to find yourself in a bind where you uh, suddenly have a little bit of a like a time crunch and you need to get mm -hmm. a video out and it's good to to make sure you're all set up to be able to avoid that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Okay. Oh, Joshua Kempo says, nice to see you back in action, Kyle. The rhino roach pair that I received from you a couple of years back just matured and with the previous, within the previous months since the babies are well on the way. Sweet. Yeah. I, usually after you, you get adults, it's the next coming spring. I've noticed with adults that have matured as late as like uh, in the year is like October, you can expect babies usually by the following spring. They just seem very cyclical for some reason to give birth right around between like January and May at the latest of, of every year. So, cool. um, all right. Somebody asked, Oh, Jihu Kim is asking what's the most difficult thing about getting roaches to mate or breed in general. 
<sighs> you know, they do a lot of the work themselves, <laughs> if they're happy, that is. Uh, I'd, I'd say that with some species, it's finding out, especially with like Parcoblata and some of the, the small uh, North American ectobiids, is finding out what gets what triggers them to mature or to get their, their eggs to hatch. So Ectobius pallidus is an extremely common uh, introduced ectobiid across the, the United States, at least the, the eastern half. And, you know, you think for being everywhere in the wild that they'd be very easy to culture in captivity. But, you know, there's some some complex thing with, you know, wild caught subadults need to be cooled a certain amount of time before they will mature to adults. But also the eggs need to be uh, dried out and then hydrated. And also, you know, th there's these things with a lot of these little extra steps. Mm -hmm. for these supposedly common species is usually the trickiest thing. Um, so something like like that with the Ectobius or Parcoblata, just getting sub-adults to mature into functional, healthy adults for some of the northern strains can be very annoying. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that makes sense because they're dealing with those, um, I guess, obligate uh, cyclical mm -hmm. factors, yeah. So Nature Man 494 asks, what's a simple beginner arachnid? Hmm, a simple beginner arachnid. Well, I would love to uh, sort of go to the, the, the low-hanging fruit and say some sort of tarantula. But if you want to have an easy arachnid that you can regularly propagate in captivity and feed something like fruit flies or springtails to and have a thriving culture, I would say... Um, probably a Vononis, a, a harvestman, or uh, a pseudoscorpion. The the Vononis need a little bit more space, but pseudoscorpions, you can keep a colony going in a 32-ounce container, and you'll have them pretty much forever instead of waiting 30 years for your Gramostola to mature <laughs> so you can <laughs> track somebody down across the country who's willing to, to provide a mate for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. So do you want to bring out your... Uh... Pseudoscorpion. Now that we're oh, I would love. That. I would love to. So, um, this is as I, I we had talked about uh, prior to the stream. Uh, nature might be night. Nature Man four nine four. Um, William Samo Jaden, who has recently started uh, pseudoscorpions.com or Will's Bug Room. Uh, he is a pseudoscorpion enthusiast. And the work in acquiring these uh, new species of pseudoscorpions from across the United States has been his passion for the past couple, okay, past couple of here. years. There we go. Wonderful. Let's see if I can convince you onto the bark. So here we have a on the move um, <laughs> Dinochiris arizonensis. So this is one of the largest pseudoscorpions that is also extremely easy to culture. Here we go. Short, illuminated against my face, I guess. So one of the largest uh, pseudoscorpions that's also very easy to culture, uh, feeding on tropical pink springtails and fruit flies. And if you had a large enough colony regularly, you could use uh, large silver springtails or any of the larger springtail species. But... Um, it's very captivating to be able to have a colony of these going and to see them go about their uh, daily business. We, uh, Will and I, Will likes to share the story with me about how he was watching his uh, Dinochirus culture and he saw um, an adult male appro approach an immature female to, whoops, it's showing my hand, I guess, to, oh, yeah. uh, to try and mate with and the, the male approached the female and tried to do the, the little thing where they, they drag them over the spermatophore. And once the adult male realized that the female was not mature, instead of trying to court her, he just threw her across the container. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just a, it's a story we talk about a lot is the, the adult male that just threw his, his possible half-daughter or something because she wasn't <laughs> reproductive age. Wow. So, but yeah, they're um, 
they're very interesting. And Dino Kyrus is drought resistant and beefy. I mean, you can actually see it here. <laughs> yeah. You know, palps are pretty big and uh, does well at room temperature and whatnot. And we, I really think that these, these small arachnids and small invertebrates will become extremely popular as people uh, sort of get into the groove of having communal enclosures and replicating basically tiny ecosystems in their home. So things like pseudoscorpions and the um, many springtails and small detritivores will be quite popular, I'd think, especially for people who are limited on space and who just really want to, to have a good bug experience. Yeah, yeah. So. Is, is that one of the species that you have in captive culture right now? Yes, this is, we've had these going since 2016. So um, they, they've been the most consistent so far. Uh, so it seems like some of the northern pseudoscorpions might need a diapause, maybe, but we're not 100% sure. Um, mm -hmm. But these are from Arizona, the, the United States Southwest, so as long as conditions are pretty good year-round, they will reproduce without any need for a diapause or anything like that. Cool. Oh, that's great. And I love, like you're saying, they're they're fairly large. They're easy enough mm -hmm. to see. And, uh, yeah, awesome. I've only seen a couple of pseudoscorpions in my life. And mm -hmm. I would like to change that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they're one of those things where they're, they are pretty much everywhere, um, especially when when the weather is pretty decent. I mean, in, in Michigan, we've gone out in my yard a couple times and found two, three different species from completely different families. And mm -hmm. in the Southwest, you know, it was, you know, under almost every rock or under, you know, pieces of bark, there were usually a couple of them. So they seem to, most of them seem to prefer things a little bit warmer and more arid. Mm -hmm. But um, up here, it's, you, you kind of got to dig around with your face on the ground for a bit to find them around yeah. here. So, um, but yeah, they're, they're out there. It just takes a lot of time in the right time of year, like usually spring and, and fall are good times because it seems the soil is moist enough for them to uh, come into the upper layers of, of it. So, Yeah, that makes sense. Well, when I go down, uh, I'm going to be go heading down south in a month or so, and I'm going to see what I can find. Maybe mm -hmm. it'll be warm enough down there to, to see what I see some. Let's see. Um, all right. Just checking on what's going on here. Some are questions. Some are just comments, so I'm kind of sorting through. Uh, Insane Isopods asks, speaking mm -hmm. of small invertebrate cultures, why are there no wild type Armadillidium maculatum in the US hobby? So um, Armadillidium maculatum, I believe the wild type are the striped individuals. And it's probably like a uh, clue guy and like Bulgari, where, you know, whatever population they came from in the wild, there can be very big differences between them. Like if you look at um, the most, the starkest example are like comparing like your backyard armadillity of Bulgari to like Punta Cana or, or St. Lucia, where those are all wild lines. There's just, you know, a great amount of diversity. And even though they're not native to where they're being collected from you know in in the in the uh the western hemisphere there's still the idea that well different founding populations they came from could have been very geographically isolated and also 400 plus years in a new environment especially if they started from a very small population size there are some very strong environmental selective factors that could drive them to basically rapidly evolve not necessarily speciate but it's the very beginning of that so right. to answer that, I think wild maculatum are the, the striped and, and spotted -y kind. Um, mm -hmm. And I do know that over the last three, four years, uh, a lot of the maculatum in the U.S., there have been some, some genes that have gotten into them that sort of distort that sort of phenotype. And some of the older lines look, you know, very different from some of the newer lines that are just distributed. So... Yeah, yeah, I've wondered about that with the uh, the yellow striped zebras. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that, for example, they seem almost always to be more spotted than striped. Mm -hmm. And so I I do have a line of yellow stripes um, that are not spotted. It came out of one of my projects. It might have come out of candy stripes. I'd, I'd have to check my 
my logs, but I do have uh, some that have bright yellow stripes. But I have noticed that it's mostly the males that have the brightest, most intense coloration uh, in those. So, but um, I mean, for example, the amount of variation is you can have a single gene responsible for a single, single, simple recessive mutation responsible for a very different phenotype. Like if you look at um, the Armadillidium vulgare from uh, Fort Stockton or from a lot of places around Texas, uh, they have a very, they have a higher incidence of the uh, orange, simple recessive orange that makes them look in vulgare, it expresses sort of a red color. So mm -hmm. you see that a lot more in the stock from Texas. You also see a lot more adult males with yellow spots on them. Um, versus in Michigan and the Midwest, it's very rare to find uh, adult males that are not just a solid gray. So, right. you know, even between different populations that have been introduced that may have had very closely related uh, founding stock, you know, 400 years ago, there's still some differences that have begun to pop up simply because they're reproductively isolated in different environments. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I've, uh, it's been interesting to, to look at how that works, I, I believe there's a canyon near my house where I collected some mm -hmm. very high yellow specimens of the you know, Armadillidium vulgari, but they, uh, the males still seem to be solid gray, mm -hmm. even though the females can be almost solid yellow sometimes, mm -hmm. but not the, not the yeah, male. Yeah, I think, I think I've seen some pictures of your line as well. Yeah. So, I've been so trying yeah, then, oh, go on. Oh, <laughs> I was, I've been trying to to breed that and, and see if I can fix it. And I, I have increased the incidence over the generations, mm -hmm. but the males don't seem to be touched at all. Yeah, it's, it's, and this is, this would be a very strong argument for somebody who's developing a line who would like to get that yellow on adult males. Well, you, you're not going to want to work with just any backyard vulgari if you wanted to get that into your project. You'd want to use stock from a population that has yellow spotting on the males so you can select from that. You don't have to do the, the, the dirty work of basically breeding out thousands and thousands of vulgari and hoping that from your one locality you get one adult male that has yellow present. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are very skeptical of keeping different locales of vulgari separate and, and labeled. And, you know, that's fine. They are an introduced species. So, you know, there's only, they've only been here for so long. There's a very finite amount of time they've been here. But at the same time, you could have stuff on the East Coast that was originally introduced from one part of Europe. And you could have stuff in the Southwest that was introduced from an entirely different source population in Europe. And then, of course, you've got a temperate deciduous forest uh, ecosystem versus, you know, a more arid desert Southwest ecosystem. So there's completely different selective forces on those. So, right. yeah, the, uh, Oren talks about that in his book about how there appear to be at least two very different phenotypes, uh, or localities or whatever of, of uh, Porcelio Levis, where there's a, mm -hmm. seems to be a very desert adapted one. Mm -hmm. um, that acts very different, not only does it live in a different habitat, but it responds very different to stimuli mm -hmm. opposed to one that lives in a, a more uh, temperate area and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I would agree with that um, from what I've seen as well. Uh, in addition to that, um, with uh, different populations being adapted for different excuse me, for different uh, environments, um, you know, there's there's everything that we can see that is different about them, which in some case might be very major, in some case might be very minor, but then there's, you know, thousands of things that we don't see that could be different about them that could manifest in culture down the road. Like, certainly a population in the desert uh, has to have adaptations for keeping, retaining moisture, um, and there could be various genes that have no visible phenotype that are, you know, that have that have uh, helped that that individual population survive there versus, you know, some something from Michigan is not going to have that same pressure. And of course, if you looked at the both of them and you're like, oh, they're both solid gray, they're both about the same size. You would never know if there's some different metabolic metabolic pathway being expressed in one or the other unless you knew where they came from, basically. So, right. Right, good point. Let's see. So Ike is asking, what would be a good cleanup crew or feeder roach that can be kept with a crested gecko? 
So you could use pretty much anything. I would go with isopods because they're smaller and not as likely to be exhausted by the crusty echo eating them. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I, I know, and this is this has been one of my labors the last couple of years is the the decimation of the reputation of Porcelio Scaber for strange reasons as some sort of protein crazy vicious isopod, but they're a really good go-to for those sort of enclosures um, with crested geckos and whatnot. And there's plenty mm -hmm. of people, myself included, who keep them with tons of sen sensitive species. Um, and have absolutely no problems. Like I have a colony of Porcelio scaber in my African giant millipede container because, well, I was using it as a grow out to see, you know, how much diversity I could get out of this one female uh, for selecting from. But um, so yeah, Porcelio dilatatus is a pretty good one too. Mm -hmm. uh, they will eventually turn the substrate into dust uh, <laughs> versus the Porcelio scaber will probably leave it relatively more intact over time. Uh, it really just depends more on uh, what the ventilation and whatnot is like in the enclosure. So a lot of the armadillidium species, the rolling up is probably, th there's two reasons, two, two uh, explanations for the adaptation. The first one is predator defense, but not from something like a crested gecko, which despite its um, broad and, and not necessarily strong uh, jaws, uh, you know, it will still be able to easily crush that exoskeleton to eat it. But um, the rolling up in, in roly polies is most likely an ant defense because they cannot be picked up. There's no exposed appendages that could be snipped off or, or carried away and whatnot. And the other explanation is it's uh, a dryness, dryness resistant uh, characteristic because by rolling up into a sphere, they're able to protect protect their um their lungs and to prevent themselves from desiccating by reducing their surface area so frequently if you go looking for armadillidium in warm dry places in the summer you'll have to dig through substrate uh, because they burrowed in because it's moister down there than being up and exposed to the elements um, but they'll also all be curled up because they are preserving their moisture so a lot of the armadillidium species tend to like things more ventilated or are rather more dryness adapted than something like a porcelio which does not roll up so mm -hmm. so going back to the crested enclosure there's a lot of ventilation you can look more into an arbidilidium if there's less ventilation you know you can go with a porcelio scaber or a classic dwarf whites or anything like that yeah yeah i've found really uh, a lot of success with my cresties with uh, both uh, Porcelia labus and mm -hmm. uh, and dwarf whites mm -hmm. seem to both of them seem to do really well, and I'm not really concerned that the Porcelia labus are going to cause a problem with the gecko. They haven't, mm -hmm. and they've been in there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there is a certain vilification that has occurred with Porcelia genus as as a potential predator of reptiles and amphibians. Mm -hmm. But I think I can't say it's never happened, but I think it's overblown. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Porcelia scaber, the the Spanish orange or you know, whatever compromised stock that it was sold as for a while has been used for like almost two and a half decades as a, a cleaner for different enclosures. Right. And, you know, you, you don't want to have the isopods in any situation overwhelming what they're being kept with. That is a recipe for disaster, no matter what species you choose. Right. Um, so I know that there's a lot of people who apparently think of like Porcelionides as a really good species and seems to be relatively innocent and all this other stuff. But um, I, I know of one, at least one report from somebody who found them munching on a freshly molted Blabrus giganteus. And that was a situation not because that species is inherently like that per se. In fact, in the wild, they feed almost exclusively on leaf litter and uh, rotting, rotting um, the softer parts of, of rotting plants. Um, but because the conditions in the enclosure just were not suitable and they weren't getting what they need to out of the feces from the roaches, maybe because the roaches weren't being fed a lot or because the moisture was off because even though they're a dry adapted species, they're still an isopod. They're more uh, dependent on moisture and then pretty much any cockroach could be or any, any, many insects would be. Right. Yeah. I think that's a good point that sometimes it could just be lack of uh, proper hydration that could cause them to do that sort mm -hmm. of thing. That makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, I know you have some other critters there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's about time we bring one out. What do you think? 
Certainly. I, I've been eyeing the uh, the comments just a little bit and have seen quite a few requests for a certain somebody here. So here we have one of my captive bred uh, African giant millipedes. This is a, I believe this is a female. I have a small breeding group from uh, some individuals that I bred back around uh, would have been whatever year Jura the first Jurassic World movie came out <laughs> was when <laughs> these guys were babies. So and they've been a little slow to grow. Um, the first couple, the the first move and the second move were kind of rough on them since I wasn't feeding them as much. Uh, so, but I have a pretty pretty nice little breeding group right now, and so I've been waiting on babies since they seem to finally be reaching or getting near maturity. So. Wow! Yeah, that one's got some nice size on it. And you know they're they're pretty pretty easy to keep. Uh, the thing is, they mainly seem to eat rotting leaves, and they need to be in not a very specific state of decomposition, but they need to be very well rotted for them to get what they need out of them. Mm -hmm. so, so you need to make sure they have the proper moisture in there, so they can get to that point and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh my! I've been pooped on. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's yeah, what I got. Oh, one well, of the kitchen towels, multi-purpose. <laughs> so. Oh, that is awesome. And so it would been, been nice if, if she had cooperated, but, you know, I can only ask for so much. <laughs> yeah, well, at, at least she's demonstrating the uh, defensive posture of many millipedes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good example of that. Unfortunately, not demonstrating the defensive secretions of a, of a millipede as well. <laughs> right, I, and I'm imagining with a millipede that big, it's, it's pretty messy. Um, the, do you find that this species secretes a lot or does it depend on individuals and how often they've been handled or I think it, it depends on how how you handle them they you know they will, when they're already defensive like this they don't necessarily like being picked up um, but you know if you let one of them crawl onto your hand when it's oh here we have a proper showing oh here um, we go or letting one crawl onto your hand when it's already you know going somewhere that they don't seem to mind that they just look at you as a part of the environment mm -hmm. so you boy or girl girl so so I'm, I'm really hoping for for babies in the near future and it's it's one of the most requested things on my site is or do you have any a gigas do you have any a gigas and all i can do at the moment is just say you know check back in a couple months because i've seen some some breeding i've seen um some pairings but from the last time that i had them it was maybe a five or six month lag between when I had reproductive individuals and when babies started popping up. So they seem to take quite a while after the eggs have been laid to actually start hatching. Okay. Quite a bit of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of surprising. I mean, I guess that's, that's for a large, large invertebrate. It's not too surprising, especially in one from one from a seasonal, you know, seasonal humidity variation of sort of climate, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess some of us get spoiled working with, you know, certain roaches that will hatch out after like a month or something like that, or, yeah. or isopods, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, so about how, how long is that specimen? Do you know, have you measured it recently? Let's see. I don't think I have, but let me see if she will cooperate just enough, maybe about a foot. Yeah, that's about what if she I looks can, like. If I can stretch stretch out all the way. Yeah, maybe about a foot. Nice. Let's see if I can get the front half to gently detach. Yeah. So maybe about a foot. Nice. Maybe a little less. Yeah, she's so, a beauty. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I've been really waiting waiting on this these guys to, to start producing babies. Um, you know, it's full circle since they are I did have to produce them myself. So it's it's like, you know, really seeing it all come together when you get basically an established culture of something really cool like this going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Invertebrate Dude wants to know if you have to induce a monsoon season to get your strain of AGBs to breed. So somebody had emailed me about that a couple of um, months ago. And the last ones that I had, the, the parents to these did not have any sort of stimulus or anything whatsoever. Um, so we'll see what happens with these guys, but they have been mating and, oh, I can, 
I can actually say no, they do not, because um, a friend of mine in Chicago, uh, Robin, who received some of these when I first had babies, I, I gave her a group. Um, she took more consistently better care of them and had adults as early as like a year ago or something like that. And she already has babies. And I know that she's just been keeping them the same way that I had told her to. So in whatever strain or actual cryptic species or whatever these are, there does not seem to be any monsoon or temperature adjustment or anything requirements. Cool. That's great. Cause I know that for, for years there was struggle to discover the secret to getting the species to breed. And now it doesn't seem as so much of a secret. It's just good care, right? I think it was probably, probably good care, but more so probably having males and females. Because I, mm-hmm. I, if I remember correctly, there was a long period of time where only mostly females were coming in for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think leaf litter i think that's very important so a lot of these millipedes there seems to be one material that they need that is basically all that they need they can get everything they need from that and then supplement their diet with dog food or or what have you but there's usually something that needs to be the core of their diet or else you know they won't thrive like um there's that there's a really colorful flat millipede on the west coast and the name is escaping me at the moment um but it's found in like washington oregon uh it's black and yellow but i was i was talking to somebody who got them breeding for a couple generations and the key was feeding them um well-rotted fir leaves and that was like the only thing that they they accepted or the only thing that they thrived on. But when they had that, they did extremely well. So I think that's kind of the case with a lot of millipedes. It's either white rotted wood or leaf litter of a, some specific type. And from there, they're, they're very simple as long as those needs are met. Mm-hmm. Some nice acrobatics here. And with, yeah. And with these millipedes, then just a variety of leaf litter seems to fit the bill. It doesn't have to be from their native country or anything like that. It's just no. I use I use um, rotted oak leaves because I live in an oak forest, so that's what I have a, a bunch of just lying around, literally. Um, but I do what I usually do is um, when I need more is I will collect it in the fall or or early spring. I will submerge it in a vats for up to a year to leach the tannins out and to allow them to decompose in an environment without, you know, like uh, wild isopods or centipedes or anything like that. And then I'll bring them indoors and use them after they've gone through that extensive treatment to make sure that all the tannins are leached out and they're well rotted. Nice. So... Oh, um, Alan John put the name, the species in the in the chat there. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's uh, Har- Harpathy Haydeniana. So. Cool. Oh, Alan actually asked a question about uh, collecting trips. He said, are there any interesting stories about collecting trips that you'd like to share? Hmm. Let's see. There, there are many, uh, not all of them fit for sharing in group settings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, there, there is the, the time, all the multiple times in, in Arizona where I've stuck my hands places. I ne- shouldn't necessarily be sticking my hands in, in search of, uh, different roaches. Uh, and so there was the, the one time we were coming back from the first Arizona trip, and we were somewhere in like West or central Texas. And there was, there's just a lot of jackrabbit burrows everywhere. So like, okay, we're going to stop here and look for something. And I put my arm into one of these burrows and it just, something just didn't feel right going into it. A lot of the burrows in like Arizona, they're like, they're dry. They've got like some like duff on the bottom. You can kind of tell that like something's using them, but not frequently. And so this this burrow seemed like something had recently been going in and out of it. So I put my arm in to try and grab the duff at the bottom to look for sand roaches. And I pulled my arm out and I was like, huh, something feels kind of weird on my arm. And I looked down at my arm and it's just covered in fleas. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's there's that's that's a good good story from from that. Um 
let's see. There's another another similar story where I put my hand into a burrow and I was stung by some sort of scorpion and I got back into the car and I felt I think it was this finger starting to go numb and I was like, okay guys, I'm gonna just drive it off. If something bad happens, one of you take the wheel. <laughs> so fortunately, it must have been like a Centroides vitatus or something because it just sort of got to about here and then it started getting better again. Um, so, but yeah, I, I look forward to what will happen on uh, this this year's possible Arizona trip. Uh, I plan on being a bit more cautious than years past, but at the same time, somebody's got to get those sand roaches. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wonder if that's, is that the uh, uh, Arena Vaga species, that, that genus? Is mm -hmm. that genus? Arena Vaga and uh, Arima blada. I think Arima blada, that might translate directly to sand roach. Arena Arinavega translates to like sand wanderer or something wanderer. like that. Yeah, yeah that makes so, sense. Um, but yeah, so I... All, all kinds of misadventures on out looking for for different types of bugs and you know i'm really looking forward to uh, going out in the middle of nowhere in florida in a couple of weeks and seeing what we can find so yeah yeah i was actually last year i was in the corner like the north eastern area of the mojave desert mm -hmm. in june and i went out at night uh with a, a uv flashlight to you know see if i could mm -hmm. blacklight some scorpions and whatnot and we did not see a single scorpion it was probably just <sighs> dry it was crazy dry mm -hmm. it, was, it was incredibly dry but we did see tons of roaches and i'm i'm imagining they must have been mm -hmm. like arena vaga or something like that would that, that make sense yeah could have been if they were winged they were probably adult male arena vaga or arima blada maybe mm -hmm. um in Texas, we when Alan and I first encountered Parco blatta deserti, we thought that they were um, red runners. We thought they were Shelfordella because there nobody's really documented any of the biology of Parco blatta deserti, mm -hmm. and so like it was weird for us to be like flipping trash in like this McDonald's lot and seeing these like black and orangish roaches run around. And at first, we were just sort of like, oh, they're just Shelfordella. And then, like, I looked at one close. I was like, why are there, like, no big ones, though? Why are they all smaller? And then I picked it up and saw, like, this is an adult female cockroach with with micropterous wings. I was like, Alan, this is not a Shelfordella. And he's like, oh. So, you know, there was, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different things that you can find just messing around in the desert is the moral of the story. Yeah. <laughs> or, or McDonald's fast food Fast food place parking lots in strange places have yet to disappoint in terms of bugs. <laughs> so many things you can find at places in the middle of nowhere that have lights on at night or just some trash in the parking lot. <laughs> so nice. Let's see. Okay, they're they're kind of responding to each other there. Um, so I know you have at least a couple other critters there. Should we take one out? Sure, I would love to. So this is a captive bred Romalia micropterra. So uh, this is from a locality that has uh, these sort of really bright yellow individuals. This one's actually recently molted and hasn't fully hardened, even though the color is that intense. It mm -hmm. usually sort of fades to more of like a, a lemony yellow in this locality in the yellow individuals. Uh, but also it produces some very bright, like fiery orange individuals. And these oh, nice. seem to be found um, in a very small area around the Everglades in uh, southern Florida. So this is my second captive bred generation of this particular locality. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm going to start separating now that I, I have the numbers up and I should have a, a fair number of pairs to work with. I'm going to start separating the, um, the oranges and the yellows. Uh, to see if I can can breed uh, for each different trait. Although it seems like they might do disassociative mating where the yellows mate with the oranges. Like the yellow males will go for orange females and um, vice versa. And it's one of the, that, that in that situation, I would say is one of the very few arguments for um, insects having anti-inbreeding um, characteristics is usually mm -hmm. when there's some sort of disassociative mating or when there's a like drastic um, difference in uh, sibling 
uh, maturity uh, time, something like orc advantage where, you know, the males usually mature or would mature in the wild very, very long before their sibling females would. So, but yeah, they're really cool. Uh, I absolutely love lovers and I uh, am looking forward to getting a ton of new localities this upcoming season because I mean, just it's a huge grasshopper. Yeah. Fun to hold. Um, just all around awesome as a as an invertebrate pet, and, and you can't really beat that color either. Oh, that's that's quite striking. And what do they eat? What's their general diet? So in the wild, they eat pretty much any sort of vegetation. Um, so any sort of weedy plants and whatnot. A lot of a lot of grasshoppers are pretty polyphagous. Like they will feed on whatever they can as long as it's not extremely toxic or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they'll eat pretty much anything. Um, they can be a pest of citrus groves in Florida um, where certain management practices are not upkept. You know, basically if the mo the lanes between uh, citrus groves are let to, to grow too much or something, uh, then the first couple gener or the first uh, couple uh, hatches of, of lovers can be uh, pesky. Other than that, they, they range all the way from East Texas all the way to, I guess, Georgia has some populations, including surprisingly far north there. Um, hmm. So, yeah, just a really cool U.S. native grasshopper. Just really so, so weird. This is like something you'd expect to find in, like, Southern Africa or Australia or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so big. <laughs> yeah, and so and this is a this is a male. This is a pretty small male too, actually. The females get even larger than this, but I didn't have any that were ready to show because most of them are subadults on the verge of molting. Or there was one female that matured earlier today, and I was like, should I bring her on? And then she's still tenoral, so I didn't want to I didn't want to cause her undue stress. But this guy's fine. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I, I and it looks like like you're saying, really easy to handle. It's not doesn't seem like it has uh, a tendency to try to leap off of you or anything. It's, that's, and, that's and part of that is because they are, they're toxic. Um, it's still not known whether they sequester toxins from certain plants they eat or if they are intrinsically toxic, but mm -hmm. um, that's what the bright colors are is a warning coloration. And if he were to get particularly upset, he would expose his hind wings, which are even more brilliantly colored than those four wings there. Um, so they're a bright, brighter neon pink. Let me see if maybe he'll just let me gently slip one of these wings out of the way. Maybe. Okay. You can see a little bit of the membrane there on yeah. the hind wing. Cool. And then if we fold that back up like that, you can see the four wing. So... Mm -hmm. Um, and there's there's some localities that are nearly solid black, so that effect is even more striking. Wow, this so, got a lot of some polymorphism going on there. You got the yellow, the orange, the black. Those are pretty cool. Pretty strange polymorphism. Um, it's just sort of a general trend with uh, flightless invertebrates, is that you tend to get a lot of uh, morphs and localities developing simply because there's there's a degree of inbreeding that has gone on there. And so, you know, the starter population could have been 10 individuals. And if striping for one reason was favored over something else, you'll end up with that being a primary trait in there, you know, thousands of years later. So yeah. a lot of lubber localities are, are quite pretty and distinct from each other. Yeah, Simply just because, because they... Oh, go on. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, just because they're not, they're not flying. So dispersal mm -hmm. genetic drift is more likely to happen with the bottlenecks that occur. That makes sense. So I was going to ask about flight in the species. It looks like those wings are pretty vestigial for flight. Mm -hmm. Not as extreme as, say, like some female roaches or anything, but still yeah. it doesn't look like that. You could support that bulky body with wings like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they probably, you know, if they didn't have a need for that display response where they flash those hind wings, I'm pretty sure that they the, the wings would have just been adapted away and they would just be a wingless grasshopper. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there's apparently some, there, there's an added, adaptive benefit to having that um, warning flash that they can do. And so the wings stick around. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just like very similar to the display that uh, mantids will do when they're irritated and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, add a little flair to the aposematism in the colors and 
scare predators off. Totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or to give them something to remember if they, you know, tasted the grasshopper because they will sometimes make a little like a, a uh, fizzy secretion. Mm -hmm. And so if something tastes that when they try to take a bite and they remember, oh, this bright neon pink thing that made a noise or, or, or tasted awful, you know, I, I'm ne probably not going to mess with that ever again. <laughs> so the fizzy secretion, is it... Uh, something they spit out of their mouth, or is it abdominally? Uh, it, it comes from. It seems to come from um, along their their abdomen. I'm not sure if I've ever seen it come out of the the thorax before. Hello, <laughs> they do crazy little antics like that all the time. Um, but yeah, it seems to kind of come out of somewhere on the the upper abdomen, um, yeah. maybe from part, maybe from somewhere underneath on the thorax as well. I usually don't see the captive individuals do it. Right, well, that makes sense. Well, wow, that is something. They're, they almost, uh, I don't know, there's something kind of hypnotic about watching it just kind of slowly wander around. Yeah, right? it's kind of like watching an aquarium. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Well, we are getting to the, uh, we're getting kind of close to the end. I know you have one other creator there for us. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I could show the Venonis. Um, as we had, we, you and I had kind of looked at earlier, I'm not really sure if they would show as well. But I do have another cockroach I can I can show for for folks. So this is one I haven't had available in a while, but fortunately another uh, cockroach enthusiast has helped me to restart my colony. This is the Mega Glow Spot Cockroach, the so Luki Hormetica Grossi. So this is a big adult male. So oh, it's a happy cool. camper. <laughs> <laughs> that is so. very you can see the spots mm -hmm. very easily. So, oh, go on, go on. <laughs> I've heard that they don't actually glow in the wild. There's, that it's not substantiated that they glow in the wild, but it just looks like they're mimicking maybe a click beetle or something. Is that true, or how does that work out? So I just read a paper, and I can try and find it on um, – I can't remember which species they use. It might have been varicosa, but there was a um, – paper saying that it's probably not luminescent in most uh, glow spot roaches but fluorescent Ooh. so and it might be associated with the amount of carotenoids in the um the roaches system and that individuals that have more carotenoids indicating that they are um, acquiring better quality food um, could be indicating a better reproductive fitness to potential mates than individuals that do not uh, consume food that has a significant amount of carotenoids in it. Interesting. So, um, so I, I can try and find that paper. You might might be very easy to find off of Google, but there's a lot of images showing that, um, in at least in captive individuals, the ones who had acquired more carotenoids um, fluoresced more um, in the laboratory setting. So I thought I, th I feel like that's a pretty compelling argument. I know that at least Luki Hormetica uh, Lucky, which is believed to maybe be extinct now, um, they did uh, document bioluminescence in Luki Hormetica Lucky, but it has yet to be documented in other Luki Hormetica species. Cool. So, so at least one is actually bioluminescent. Yes, but uh, Luki Hormetica Lucky is is confirmed to be bioluminescent. So, very cool. Yeah. So, if there's any other questions, I guess, or or from you or from anybody else, while we're man, it really doesn't feel like it's been an hour and a half. <laughs> no, it doesn't it? Just breezes by. I could I could mm -hmm. keep talking for sure. Um, I have a question for you uh, on behalf of everybody who's been watching. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to contact you, what's the best way to do that? What, can you tell us about your website and everything? E emails at the moment. Um, and this is, you know, it's a, I'm going to pull up my site for a second. So basically uh, going to the website, going to order slash contact us, and then sending an email to roachcrossing at gmail.com is the best way at the moment. Um, I am about to, I just used up all of my heat pack slots. I only had one more box of heat packs um, before uh, getting ready for the Florida trip. So I'm all filled up for orders going out next week since I had to also postpone all the orders from this week because of the snowstorm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, but basically uh, sending an email and I will be back to uh, taking and shipping out orders after the trip. So my next set of orders, the next time I can probably send out orders for those interested will probably be around March 15th or 16th since I'm going to be gone from the 28th through about the 12th. So, but sending me an email is, is the best way. Um, in the past, I know I've been fairly unreliable with emails and it's you know it's been during the move and other things like that but i've really sort of prioritized my schedule to be able to clear emails on certain days so at the moment emails is the way to go the roachcrossing at gmail.com awesome and the website is just roachcrossing.com roachcrossing .com. yep cool. awesome oh i have one more question i actually have 700 more questions but um, <laughs> uh the uh we talked about this a little bit online. I think a lot of my listeners will be interested in this, that one uh, viable method of controlling fungus nets is a biocontrol that you've been using. And I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's something like Delosia coriaria. Yep, that sounds about right. And my, my brain still, it's it's a, a Latin that I've only started using, so my brain hasn't really processed it yet. But I think it's Delodia cor coriaria. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Delosia cor coriaria. Um, and yeah, I love them. Uh, they're wonderful. Uh, usually how it works is um, they don't, you can add them and they, they very significantly impact fungus gnat populations. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they work more as a co consistent suppressant. So uh, if you have a fungus gnat problem and you add them, you will notice an immediate drop in the number of fungus gnats that, you know, that your cultures and whatnot are producing. But mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a lag time between when you set up a new culture, you know, with a lot of organic matter and fungus gnats colonize it, and when the beetles will actually start combating them in that enclosure. They, um, something they seem to cue in on is probably something produced by the fungus gnat larvae. And so it takes a little bit of time between when you start up a new culture of, you know, whatever you're putting organic matter into and when the rogue beetles get there. But once they're there, they they just completely decimate the fungus gnats in whatever enclosures they get into. So, And, and they will uh, populate different enclosures in the room. Yes. Yes, they will. <laughs> so, you don't have to seed the enclosure necessarily as long as they're in the room. As and long as there's some way that they can get into another enclosure, they will find a way in to get at the fungus gnat larvae. That is awesome. And you were saying they don't significantly impact isopod or springtail populations. Nope. They're in pretty much every bin that I have, including some of the fancy, the fancier springtails. Um, and they don't seem to cause any problems. Uh, and this is, you know, for with absolute certainty, I can say they don't cause any problems to CF Fulsomia canada or Sinella curvicida or to small silvers. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can't recommend them enough. If people are having fungus net problems, they will just completely decimate, and then you'll have a sustaining population to take care of future fungus net blooms. Um, so it doesn't, you know, if you have fungus gnats and you have a big problem and you add them, you will notice the problem, you know, pretty much go away after a while. But if you give the fungus gnats an opportunity to recolonize a container, there will be a little bit of a lag time between when the beetles are able to detect them and then eliminate them. So. Yeah, well, I definitely want to try it out. Like uh, we've been talking about it. I need to need to send you a follow up email on that. Mm -hmm. I definitely want some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just they're great. Um, I really wish that there was a biocontrol for uh, fruit flies that would work the way that these do, you know, other than, you know, just removing uneaten food before they can colonize it. But yeah, they just, they're really great. And, you know, I could see them maybe being used as a feeder for dart frogs or something like that in the future too. Mm. Um, but I wonder, I do wonder, cause that's similar to the pathway that the dart frogs sequester a lot of their toxins is by eating different beetles. That's so true. I'm wondering if you could accidentally retoxify your dart frogs uh, like that. <laughs> so I won't make any bold statements here. I need to do some more research on this, but. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that, yeah, I can see what you're saying there, but this, it's really promising in terms of uh, just dealing with fungus nets and the, the thing that that was worrying me at first is that a lot of greenhouses, when they publish, you know, they'll put out an ad for these beetles because a lot of greenhouses are selling mm -hmm. them. And they'll say these will control, and then they have this huge list, and they add springtails to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm yeah, much more. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, that 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 seems like they may just be covering themselves for for various reasons. Um, I can't see why you would list them having a, a wider host range unless people in greenhouses find having springtails annoying, which I guess you you could. Um, but like a lot of a lot of um, row beetles tend to have a kind of narrow range of like reproductive needs so like they'll 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 be relatively specialist which is why there's so many different species of road beetles as they just find different niches in the wild and they become extremely specialized and because they have very high dispersal rates as adults um they can you know they can fully exploit that sort of strategy um but i i don't i don't see why they would list a wider host range than the the species actually has so yeah yeah, it's kind of strange. It might just be an oversight. Yeah, and then people started copying what one person said mm -hmm. and it just kind of spread around, which makes sense. Um, and do you find that the beetles are like annoyingly flying around or anything? Is my oh, wife I, I, that barely, I, I around? barely ever see them. Um, uh, my my neighbors, uh, shout out to Joe and Maddie if you're watching this by any chance, but they uh, recently bought a house and they were having some fungus gnat problems for a while. And that was one of their concerns was like, well, you have some fungus gnats flying around. They're really annoying. Are the beetles going to be like exactly the same? And they definitely do not. They they definitely do not even know that the beetles are there most of the time. Uh, the worst that'll happen is you'll see one in like the corner of a windowsill, but they don't seem to actively fly, you know, through the open air column like fungus gnats will. And mm -hmm. they certainly do not hone in on your face either. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, okay. Well, I'm definitely sold. So. I'll be sending you an email. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> sure. And uh, I, I've been using a, a trap that I really like. The, mm. It has the ultraviolet light that draws in the fungus nets. It works great, but biocontrols are better when you can use those. Yeah. Can. Or, you know, integrated pest management. Use a little bit of everything, you know, yeah. where you can. So. Good point. Good point. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, I am... Just about the time I've got to go pick up my daughter. But I just wanted to thank you, Kyle. It's been great. Yeah, I thank you so much for having me, Russ. I'm, I'm glad we could do this and maybe in the future do another one. Oh, totally. <laughs> I will be up for it. There's so much more we could talk about. So, yeah, let's do it. Let's All right. Through. Wonderful. So, um, and thank you, everybody who showed up in the chat. I, I, I see the conversation there. And yes, uh, invertebrate dude, I do see the, the, the interesting thing there about Luki Hormetica not necessarily having. A tangible amount of bioluminescence that's very interesting we'll have to talk about that at some point too so but yeah thank you for having me yeah it's been my pleasure and like you said we'll do it again sometime that'd be great and uh thank you for joining everyone and uh we'll see you later sweet night everybody hope you enjoyed everything and i'll see you all around <laughs>